Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and today I would like to break down a scene within the 2002 film entitled Wicked Spring. The opening of this film offers, I feel, a very realistic depiction of the Civil War Battle of the Wilderness, which took place the first week of May in 1864. This was, in essence, since the first time that Ulysses Grant and Robert E. Lee faced off with one another, and the violent tone of this battle set the stage for the war of attrition that would follow, the bloodiest year within the American Civil War. This is an independently produced film. It is not necessarily a well-known one, but I show the first 15 or so minutes of this movie to students in my one Civil War class because even though it may lack a certain degree of cinematic big screen flair that we might see in the movie theaters, I think it really captures the essence of the plight of the average soldier. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at this scene depicting the Battle of the Wilderness from the movie Wicked Spring. The first glimpse of the battle that we see here shows this very smoky environment. Uh, and this battle was in this uh, thickly wooded area about 20 miles below Fredericksburg, Virginia. The Battle of Chancellorsville had taken place there almost exactly a year prior and according to some men the vegetation was so thick within this area that you could uh, hardly see 10 feet uh, down your own line as it was advancing and indeed we see the confederate soldiers here uh, advancing toward equally desperate united states troops and speaking from a material culture standpoint. I don't think there's very many Civil War films that do a finer job of accurately depicting how Civil War soldiers dressed and acted in battle. I think in many ways uh, this is a movie that is uh, by reenactors for reenactors uh, to an extent. Uh, but the, the wardrobe is just top-notch here in so many regards. One of our main characters that we just saw here uh, is a U.S. sergeant and we see one of his primary jobs here and that is to keep the men in line, uh, prevent any would-be shirkers from uh, falling back, uh, keep them focused, keep up their rate of fire. Uh, acting as a file closer, if you will. Now, this was one of the primary purposes of a non-commissioned officer in Civil War infantry. We also see that the woods are on fire. Uh, there are some horrific tales from the Battle of the Wilderness where men were being wounded. Uh, they could uh, not evacuate themselves. Men could not reach them. Uh, and many of them ended up burning alive or suffocating as a result. Press on the course, men. Press. We also get this very grim sense of what the, the mini ball or the mini ball uh, can do to the human body. And uh, one aspect that I think is very effective here in these scenes is, is the sound of battle. Uh, even though I'm a big fan of the movie Gettysburg, I think something that is uh, very noticeably absent is uh, the lack of whistling from the bullets uh, that are whizzing through the air. And as a lot of Civil War soldiers recollected, it often sounded like a swarm of angry hornets were enveloping you. And so I think that's uh, one area where this excels. I'll miss it. When one of your comrades passes away in battle, uh, it's, it's very different, I think, from the military today, because military outfits today, you have troops from all over the country. With these Civil War regiments, though, you have individuals who knew one another growing up. They were childhood friends, and so it, it becomes all the more uh, dreadful and tragic when you see a comrade perish. And we see here as well the 
the importance of dying a good death, uh, putting on your best face as your friend is, is clutching you in your final moments. That idea of chivalry, of conveying best wishes to loved ones back home, uh, these were sublimely important notions to Civil War soldiers. And we just saw a, an enlisted man uh, clubbing his officer with the butt of his rifle. Uh, and indeed, uh, this is not being exaggerated at all. And I have here an account by a soldier by the name of S.B. Cummins, who was an enlisted man in the 151st New York Volunteers. And this is what he had to say about a portion of the battle for the wilderness. He said, uh, of May 6th, 1864, the fighting commenced at daylight. The cannons roared like thunder. Several charges were made, but very little was accomplished on either side. Our lines were broken. The rebels made a grand charge on the 1st Division of the old 6th Corps. And after a hard struggle, our line was broken and driven back. But the provost guard fixed bayonets and stopped every man. Our line was soon formed again, and at dark, the old 6th Corps charged on the rebels and drove them out from the breastworks they had taken from us before 10 o'clock in the evening. And so there is a first-hand account where there are there's testimony of uh, soldiers breaking, soldiers running away, and the provost guard, the equivalent of modern day MPs, are having to stop them from uh, running away. We see the young drummer boy losing his life here in this regard. Indeed, drummer boys did find themselves in harm's way. It was not often that they became fatalities in combat, uh, but that risk and that peril was most definitely there. General! We're trying to find you, sir. Spreads everywhere. We're being flanked, General. General Meade says. Where you have us to, sir? The hell with this report. We're going to hold this little bit of conversation here among the general and his staff officers uh, speaks to the overarching chaos in these earliest phases of uh, what would become known as the Overland Campaign. Uh, and so it's uh, an important bit for the audience there to get a, a strategic summation to make a little bit of sense of some of the chaos that we see depicted on screen. And as some soldiers recollected, uh, they were just running away like a, like a, a herd of, of scattered or scared deer. Uh, and it was just absolute pandemonium and people are getting uh, caught in the underbrush uh, and it was just a, a, a wild affair. One of the major points that I think that is apparent in this film is the idea of, of empathy. Uh, once again, this isn't a, a well-known war film, um, but it most definitely is an anti-war film, especially if you watch it uh, the whole way through. Uh, in these earliest moments of the movie, uh, we see our two main characters, one from the Confederate Army, one from the United States Army, and both of them have lost comrades who are apparently very close to them. Uh, and so, regardless of what uniform they are wearing, regardless of the cause for which they fight, uh, in moments like this, it is almost immaterial. Uh, this is a film that is about the plight of the common soldier. And you very much get the sense of how harrowing and emotionally traumatic it is when they lose people who are close to them.
You might consider it odd by today's standards for a grown man to kiss another grown man on the forehead in a moment like this. Uh, but men displayed affection very differently back in Victorian times as the Civil War was ongoing. In a lot of Civil War photographs, you see um, men grasping each other, they are holding each other's hands, they're showing these bonds of, of brotherly affection. Uh, and so there was a, a different standard of acceptability and ways to, to show such affinity in the 1860s in contrast to today. We even see uh, bullet holes in the trees here. Um, in places like the wilderness um, and other places like uh, Culp's Hill at Gettysburg, um, you see an entire generation of young saplings being uh, wiped out. Uh, and so there's good little period details here. And these reconstructions of uh, the breastworks that are built uh, is a little bit of foreshadowing of the long and drawn out siege at Petersburg, which is uh, to begin only a few months down the road. Uh, we also see a, a beleaguered Confederate here um, who has just opted to give up the fight and uh, has started to uh, smoke his pipe and submit to becoming a prisoner. Uh, there are accounts of such things like that happening. And it was not a good idea for that man to throw away his canteen, but in the thick of battle, as individuals are fleeing for their lives, they will often throw off every piece of additional weight that they feel is superfluous. Uh, and on the roads leading out from these battlegrounds, um, they would be littered with canteens, knapsacks, busted rifles. Uh, every little bit of additional weight would be discarded. They weren't always thinking straight as they were doing so, uh, but such was the case. And the soldier who was just wounded here, uh, if memory serves correctly, uh, his character is an immigrant soldier. Um, there is a very large number of German Americans and Irish Americans that are comprised in the ranks of the Union's Army of the Potomac. And uh, they were fighting for their citizenship to prove that they were uh, worthy of these various rights of citizenship. And here we also see a skeleton lying in the embankment. And what that is meant to be is a, a fatality from the year's uh, previous fighting uh, around Chancellorsville. The, these two battles overlap over the same territory merely a year apart. Uh, and so it had this rather uh, apocalyptic look to it. I encourage you to watch the remainder of Wicked Spring and to share your own thoughts in some of the comments below. Uh, some are a little bit critical that the, the plotting and the pacing uh, after this uh, doesn't keep up with the speed and the intensity of what we see here. Uh, but as a point of historical recreation, uh, I think some of these opening elements of Wicked Spring do a very admirable job of capturing the chaos and the intensity and the uncertainty of the battle of the wilderness. And as I've said, I've, I've shown this 10 or 15 minute clip in the classroom and uh, students respond to it in a very positive manner. Uh, it allows them to visualize the nightmare that was the battle of the wilderness. And certainly there are very other few cinematic or even documentary representations of that fight. And so I think it is a very useful visual toll, whether it be for Civil War buffs or in the classroom. Uh, as I use it. So we'll go ahead and wrap things up here for this episode. Have you ever seen Wicked Spring? I would like to hear 
some of your opinions on the matter. And if you haven't seen it, uh, perhaps it is worthwhile to check out after our brief breakdown that we have just completed. I'm also curious to hear your thoughts on what other Civil War films you appreciate. Are there any iconic battle scenes that you would like me to break down in future episodes? If so, I want to hear from you. Until then, stay curious. We'll see you next time on Real History.